the Pilansberg and the rain. Oh yeah. So I've brought you to an actual game reserve with actual animals. And as luck will have it, it's raining. So I've come to the Pilansberg for some top secret, top secret work. Uh, a job that is very, very, very top secret. Uh, so top secret that I can't tell you what it is. Um, again, I've only got a short amount of time to pop in and out. I'm actually staying at Sun City where I've got a meeting a little bit later. A top secret meeting for very important top secret type science people. Uh, no, that, that's not true. Um, but I thought I'd quickly rush in here and see if I can show you at least something for a change. I'm sorry all of these trips are so short when I do manage to get to a reserve, but um, that's just the way it is. I can't do much about that. And I'm sorry about the weather. I certainly can't do anything about that. And we'll try our best to show you something interesting. I had no other time but this couple of hours to shoot in here, so I couldn't really wait for the rain to let up. It is summer. And it is their rainy season, so you'll notice when I eventually show you something that uh, it's quite green. And it's clearly their rainy season, because it is raining. And it's going to be raining the whole week. Not here. If you're wondering where they are, whoa, uh -oh, focus. I found the monotonous logs. So no longer on cheetah plains. They've uh, erupted here in the Pilansberg. And that's erupted with an I. I R R. Not erupted with an E. So not like a volcano. Uh, it's a biological term. But speaking of volcanoes. If you have a look behind, you'll see these uh, these little mountains, these little ridges covered in fog. And these ridges, if you look at the Pilansberg, if you look at the Pilansberg uh, from an aerial photo or on Google Earth, give that a go, you'll see uh, these ridges are in concentric circles. They're in rings. Because this used to be a massive volcano. So, a volcano that imploded into itself. And it's not active anymore. I think the last time that this stuff was going off was about 1.3 billion years ago. So we should be safe. But it's one of the best preserved, or the best examples of a alkaline volcano that you'll find anywhere in the world. So these ridges are in concentric circles. They're basically dikes. As the, as the volcano collapsed into itself, it's left these ridges of, uh, what's this stuff called? Cenetic or uh, foyite. I think it's called foyite. It's basically, it's similar to granite. So it's an igneous rock, similar to granite, but without any quartz in it. So very low silica, very low quartz, or silica oxide. Uh, kind of similar to a feldspar, I guess. But very, very hard, very tough. And um, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't weather or erode as much as the, the surrounding area. So these, these ridges have remained here for a billion years. Not really weathering down too much. But I've spotted something else. I'm sure you're very excited. But 
by the male impala that wet. I'm also stopping here and talking about geology because uh, I quite enjoy geology but giving those people a bit of a chance to drive further on so I don't keep on running into them. So there seems to be a little bachelor herd. See those are markings on their on their butt. You can see when it wags its tail you could see a dark genital cleft. And one of the hypotheses is that these black marks on the rump they're not just a follow me signal but they they kind of mimic that genital cleft from more angles so that um, their buddies can uh, can see their genitals from more angles in the herd. I'm not sure why they want to see each other's genitals but also they can cover their genitals uh, so flies don't get in but also show them off at the same time. So the rain has stopped a little bit which has made some of the birds come out. If I can find them. Uh, there's one. What have we got here? Avid birders. One of the most beautiful birds in the world of the genus Cysticola. That is a rattling Cysticola, Cysticola chiniana. So the impala don't have preorbital glands in front of their eyes. Those aren't glands that you can see there, those markings. When you see them rubbing their face against the grass, they've actually got uh, glandular foreheads. So a lot of their scent marking comes from their, from their forehead. They rub their forehead against the bushes, not their preorbital gland. Because they don't have a preorbital gland. They've obviously got those tarsal glands on their on the feet. You can see there's a little opening there where scent comes out. So that maybe that this can serve as a follow me or a scatter signal. When they do that high jump, they're getting chased by wild dogs. It might help the, the animals regroup. I know that some of the guides don't enjoy that uh, explanation. But I, I, it makes sense to me if they're wafting scent through the air as they run, it might be easier to follow where everyone's gone. So I actually came on this loop to look for some dogs, but um, some wild dogs. So these are jackals. They are related to the wild dogs. They're in the Canidae, but I often hear a lot of misinformation. So you basically get these jackals coming off a branch of the family tree. And then you get the wild dogs and then you get some other wild canids from around the world. But then eventually you get to the wolves and the domestic dogs. So they are, the wild dogs are in between these jackals and the, the wolves and the domestic dogs and the family tree. You might be able to hear those monotonous larks again. But I often hear that uh, when people are asked, are the 
on the wild dogs and the jackals related or the wild dogs and the domestic dogs you know this term of relatedness it gets quite tricky so if you want to go far enough back everything is related so it depends on what you mean so are they the closest to each other is it's probably the question that people are, are asking and wild dogs are in the canis group with the domestic dog and the jackal but it always gets confusing because people say the genus name is Lycion and not Canis like uh, the wolf Canis lupus or the dog Canis lupus familiaris but they get tricked because the genus Canis is what we call paraphyletic that's a big word but basically it means that not all things called Canis are grouped together nicely in a little tight group because we've got these wild dogs in particular Lycion sitting slap bang in the middle between Canis mesomelis which is the jackal and Canis lupus which is the wolf and the domestic dog so even though the jackal and the domestic dog are both called Canis as the genus name they're not each other's closest relatives so it goes jackal Canis mesomelis Lycion pictus the wild dog a couple of others Canis and then the wolf and a domestic dog Canis lupus so don't get tricked just because the jackal and the domestic dog are both both in the genus Canis uh, wild dogs are in the middle and they're more closely related to the domestic dog than the jackal is even though the jackal shares the same generic name clear clear as mist clear as mud what we've got here is something quite special obviously a water buck by the water it's not the most special sighting however look how young that baby is now water buck mothers hide their little water buck babies and only visit them for about an hour a day to clean them she'll eat the feces and she'll feed her baby and then hide it again in the bushes and waterbuck babies everyone says that waterbuck have um, a horrible smell which they do have it was often thought that the smell was to repel predators like uh, lions but we know that's not true lions do enjoy a good waterbuck but it seems to be that that smell is to repel biting flies oh, I've been spotted maybe the baby is looking for somewhere I hope I haven't interrupted the nursing no, it seems to just be happy happy to see mummy so the smell has been used it's been manufactured in the laboratory or replicated in the laboratory and is being used as a type of insect repellent for cattle especially where there's tsetse flies so the the smell of the water buck seems to help repel biting tsetse flies which can carry sickness and uh, sicknesses and diseases for cattle so they synthesized synthesized the odor of a water buck into a chemical spray which is obviously safe for the environment and spraying it on cattle in areas where biting flies are a big problem and carry diseases to cattle but now you have to ask yourself if uh, if it works 
Will cattle now go into areas where they were otherwise not able to go because of all of the biting flies and diseases? And will that mean that more habitat is destroyed for pastures and grazing for cattle? It's an interesting, interesting conundrum. It's, we make these advances, but will the fantastic fly defense of the waterbuck ultimately lead to their demise with habitat destruction and um, increased grazing and pasture lands for cattle. So she'll leave her baby hidden in some shrubbery for most of the day and he come back to visit every now and then. Um, but the baby does not have the smell yet. Uh, so it makes me wonder, I don't think anyone studied it, but it makes me wonder if they uh, are more susceptible to biting flies before they get their smell. Obviously don't have the smell yet so they can hide better from uh, predators and not give away their position with being smelly. But does that make them more susceptible to biting flies, I wonder. I don't know if anyone studied that. Um, problem is, because mommy leaves the babies alone for so long, the babies do sometimes get bored. They're not very well behaved. So sometimes you'll see a really young baby waterbuck calf just wandering around on its own because it got bored waiting for mom to come back and they just head off doing their own thing and that can lead to you know lead to them getting in trouble he seems to be having a great little time so here are the little hippies a part of hippies can just imagine uh, oh, on his back wonderful just imagine the uh, Valentine's Day jokes that are happening today it is Valentine's Day after all I'm sure if James Hendry is on drive there will be a couple of scuba Steve and snorkel Sarah jokes What did you get me for Valentine's Day, Steve? Oh, I didn't get you anything, Sarah. Why not? You never get me anything nice. Well, I got you this nice pond. But who are all these other girls? No, uh, they mean nothing to me. Something like that. He's much better at it than me. I don't know why he makes them so dopey. Oh. Oh gosh. I didn't get you anything today. Oh Steve. You're so unromantic. Mum. Didn't know I had to be romantic. Thought I just needed a big pond and big mouth. Right. Wonder when their babies stop being uh, so fun and become boring. Oh, there we go. Some romance. Ears back. Put on some some nice Barry White. Not while the kids are watching, Steve. Mm, come on, Sarah. It's a special day. Right, well, I don't want to know what's going on under the water.
I just said pod of hippos. Here yeah, they have surfaced. The lovers. I said pod of hippos. Uh, pod is one of the few that I don't mind. Strange enough, but I've got a very strange kind of hate towards these collective nouns. They're called, they're called terms of venery. It's pod of hippos and uh, gaggle of geese and crash of rhino and uh, tower of giraffe and journey of giraffe. I, um, I'm not only, I've got a strong dislike for them. A group of generally works fine for me and I don't know if I'm gonna sound a little bit uh, full of nonsense but one of the reasons I dislike them is because they were hunting terms first and foremost so we already try and stop people using the term big five because of the old hunting connotations but in terms of venery they were they're twofold not only were they hunting but they were terms I think made up not by fancy, fanciful romantic poets just uh, being poets but they were made up by the upper class hunters and I think they were they were actually designed as a type of class system to be classist so if you weren't posh enough or educated enough to know all of the stupid collective nouns for an animal then you weren't in the clique you weren't in the posh group, uh, you weren't in the upper class, and you weren't, frankly, welcome into the inner sanctum of the posh white colonial hunter. If you didn't know all the stupid names for things, then you must be uh, low class and not accepted into the cool kids group. And I find anything that is designed primarily to be... Uh, a way of segregating people or separating them by class or any kind of thing like this as a way to uh, I guess it's like a sibboleth basically if you don't fit in with the group then you're in the out group and you don't understand our terms then it's a way of identifying lesser people and um, and being classist, pretty much. And what have we come across here? Yeah, so that's why I don't like them. I find them unnecessary. And... Oh, there we go. It's a bee. It's a bee. Um, don't know where he was going. But um, he's got places to be. So I think that these terms of venery are classist and designed purely as a tool to be prejudiced against an outgroup. And that might seem far-fetched or extreme viewpoint to take, but that's the viewpoint I take. Um, I don't like it. And it's not just because I'm too lazy to learn them all. I think they're stupid. I'm not romantic. I'm not poetic. And frankly, uh, a group of, I'm pretty happy to stick with that. You can tell actually, it's still used uh, uh, as a way of showing off uh, to go like, oh, there's a, I don't know if you've noticed over there, over there. Over the hills, I think I saw a journey of giraffe traveling over there across the hills. We might go and have a look, have a look at them just before uh, the crash of rhino. And what did you see? Oh, no, no. I don't think you saw, I don't think you saw a herd of rhino. Are you sure, I'm sure it wasn't a crash? I think that's what we call it. Pip, pip. No offense uh, to the. Of course, English people, 
that I have just insulted. Sorry about the accent. I... I'm not very good at accents. Here are some giraffe, a group of giraffe, or rather, they seem to be towering. They are towering at the moment, a tower of giraffe. That one at the back is journeying. So here's a female. Here is a female. Look at that long tongue. It's going to cross the road. Majestic beasts. Now you often hear them say that the tongue is blackish purple. Full of melanin, they say. To reduce the effects of sunburn on their tongue because they spend so much time with the tongue out of their mouth. Now. I don't buy that. I spoke to a professor of anatomy and said, what, um, what do you think is going on with these dark colored tongues? And he said, it's probably full of myoglobin. Um, it's a muscle that gets used so much throughout feeding that if it's pumped full of myoglobin, it'll give it that dark color and it will increase the amount of time that the giraffe can use that muscle without it uh, getting fatigued, which makes a lot more sense to me. So extra myoglobin, extra amount of oxygen feeding that muscle gives it more time to forage and to use that muscle extensively before it gets cramps, before it, yeah, before the muscle gets fatigued. And it just kind of makes more sense to me than uh, than the sunburn story. I'll tell you why. Uh, another reason why I don't like it is the okapi has a dark colored tongue. Also very long and uh, prehensile. It's a relative of the giraffe. And it lives in the dark closed canopy forest without any sun. And it also has a dark tongue. Now, I'm not sure if the ancestor of both was a savannah species that required a long tongue to be dark to prevent sunburn, but it just kind of makes more sense to me that both are using them at the moment. Uh, both are dark colored because uh, they use them a lot uh, as their main foraging apparatus and just prevents fatigue of the muscle. So I'm a bigger fan of that hypothesis than the sunburn story. Now they are journeying by the looks of things. Well, that one's now towering. The baby at the back. Uh, don't know what it's doing. Now they also spend a lot of time. Giraffe actually spend more time feeding below shoulder height than the tips of the trees. And this has got a lot of people also questioning the utility of that long neck for foraging on high, high branches. Obviously they do do it, but did it evolve that way just so they can do it? So the animals with the longest necks, the males, which can reach the highest, in times of drought, when long necks are supposed to come into their own seem to succumb quite quickly to 
lack of forage and they, they die quicker than these ones with the smaller necks because they have to obviously eat a lot more food to sustain their large body size then the hypothesis is that they are used for fighting in the males and the females just have them because they are some kind of linked gene like male nipples if the males got them then the females do as well but I reckon that the necks are actually quite short and that their legs are long so they've got long legs to travel far distances and to see a lot as a predator avoidance and that their necks need to be long so that they can drink water and their necks are not long enough because they have to do that ridiculous leg spreading just to get down to the water so I, I reckon that their, their legs are the things that have got long rather than their necks their necks kind of had to get long so that they can drink rather than these long necks for eating because the babies are quite small so you'd expect if their long necks are just for foraging in times where forage down low has been eaten by competition then small females and babies would all die because they're not particularly tall yet certainly not as tall as the males but I don't know maybe I just uh, prefer alternative hypotheses to these ones that have been going around maybe it makes me feel smart but I don't like the idea of the long necks for eating high I don't particularly like the idea of the long necks just for fighting I think it's a combination of all of them but, but, but I, I prefer the idea that they um, have got long necks so that they can drink and they've actually the long legs have been selected for let me see if we can get a bit closer So they don't make much noise. I'm sure you've heard that they're silent. They do actually screech in game capture situations. Uh, so they can make a noise. The story about them humming, I'm not sure about that either. Apparently it does happen. I think it's maybe infrasonic communication going on. So large body animals often use infrasound we're finding out but they are a classic example of bad design so there's a recurrent laryngeal nerve oh my goodness are you joking traffic There's this recurrent laryngeal nerve that comes from the brain and innovates onto the larynx, the voice box, which is uh, the brain is at the top of the head and the voice box is also near the top of the head. But pretty early on in our evolutionary history, that nerve has found itself looped around the aorta 
around one of the big pipes that goes into the heart. And for giraffe, that results in a couple of meters long nerve that shouldn't be there. So it goes from the brain all the way down around the heart, then all the way back up to the larynx. So instead of going 12 inches, it probably goes about 12 feet, which is a pretty good example of terrible design. It's one of the good examples, one of the good reasons why this kind of uh, intelligent design might not uh, hold much water. Because to explain a big detour like that on a nerve that only needs to go a few inches, to have to now loop all the way down that long giraffe neck around the heart back up to the larynx. Um, it's easier to explain something like that through a process of evolutionary changes and um, it's just a product of the evolution that it has to do this ridiculous detour rather than just go to where it is required had evolution not played a part in that um, placement of these nerves. I was wondering where the male is because uh, I'm sure you'll know by now these are called uh, blow up in Afrikaans and the blow up is because of their fantastically blue testicles and um, their testicles are blue to show them off which is uh, quite nice but um, it turns out they think that one of the reasons that their testicles are blue, not because of any blue pigmentation as such, it's just the orientation of the of the melanin. Kind of like uh, the glossy starlings, you know, when the light hits it at a certain angle, uh, it reflects off. So it's, the glossy starlings aren't blue in particular or green, but the way that the light reflects off the melanin in the feathers depends on what wavelength of light comes back to you. Now the, the testicles of the the vervet monkey are this wonderful kind of um, baby powder, or maybe a bit darker than that, kind of like the like the sky blue. And it's thought that a similar thing is happening. So if you put, if you go now with your kids, it's a fun little experiment to do, and pour a glass of water, and then if you throw some flour into that glass of water you'll see that it turns a slightly blue color and the flower obviously isn't blue and the water is not particularly blue but the way that the light scatters it's called Rayleigh or Tyndall scattering one of the two uh, causes the blue wavelength to to come back to your eye where that it scatters the light it's the same reason why uh, the sky is blue or similar mechanisms, so the Tyndall scattering and the Rayleigh scattering are two slightly different mechanisms but uh, it's a good way to demonstrate it with the flower is the way that the lights wavelengths get broken up and then you get this blue tinge coming through so they think that's what's going on with the with the monkey testicles is they're not actually pigmented blue but the way that the the testicles reflect light. I shouldn't be giggling at that, I'm a scientist. The way the testicles reflect light uh, makes them look blue, which is uh, which is quite exciting if you enjoy testicle facts. And frankly, I don't know anyone that doesn't. You might see a tiny little bird. And you might hear this tick, tick, tick. Or oh, trying to get one in flight might be impossible. Here's one. Oh no. These are zitting cysticulars. 
zitting because they tick, 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 zit around. They like these rank, kind of moist, moist grasslands. You'll find them in lucerne fields, and you find them in all sorts of uh, areas with a bit of, bit of moisture and long grass. They do this aerial display. Uh, which is fairly impossible to catch on camera, uh, I've found. But for those of you in Europe, you might be familiar with this little bird. Because of the 50 to 60 species of cysticlas, two of them occur outside of Africa. This one occurs outside and inside Africa, as you can see. And um, the other one is Cysticla exilis, the exile, is uh, in the Australias. Oh no, this isn't working. But this one occurs here all the way up through Europe all the way across to Asia. So we've got about got about 50 or so species of cysticlas in, in I'd say 50 or so because there's going to be a few more. Let's, let me just clean clean off. So a lot of people just drive past the sticklers without uh, giving them the time of day. I'll, uh, I'll grant you that they're quite hard to get on camera. And when you do get to look at them, they are small and brown. So that might not be everybody's cup of tea. But they are my cup of tea because they're really, really interesting. And they're interesting from a few different a few different points. There's so many of them. They're all over the place. They make a lot of noise. They're easy to find. And they occupy most habitats that we have. Uh, in Africa but they all do look very very similar they're all small they're all brown they are the classic LBJ and not many people have done that much work on them so I say between 50 and 60 because we don't we don't actually know how many cysticlas exist or how many species exist we certainly don't know how many individuals exist but we don't even know how many species exist and this has been a problem for quite a long time. Uh, in the 1930s, there was a gentleman called Rear Admiral Lines, Hubert Lines from the Royal Navy. He was really interested in cysticlas. He did a couple of tours through Africa and he saw these things buzzing around, making a lot of noise. He saw them everywhere he went and he thought, well, what are these little brown birds? And he went to go try and find out. And what he found, was that nobody really knew. They were a mess. The same things were described multiple different times by different people as different things. So he sat down, uh, this is probably 1920s or so, he sat down and he said, all right, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. So he went on a couple of tours through Africa. He collected a few individuals and made meticulous notes about their habitat, their calls, what they look like, and he said, once and for all, well, he's going to try his best to sort out what was going on with these little cysticlas. So, and by collect, I mean, it's a fancy, sciencey word, a euphemism, if you will, for shot. So he drove around and shot a whole bunch of small cysticlas, uh, which was turned out to be very useful. And he sat down and he published a monograph, 800 and 60 odd page monograph just on cysticlas and said right this is how I'm going to sort them out I'm going to group them into different groups of how I think they're related and hopefully this will help people in the future figure out what is going on with cysticlas and that was in the 1930s when he published his monograph and it is still basically the go-to guide for cysticlas. If you want to start anywhere with cysticlas, you start with Lines' monograph on cysticlas in the 1930s. And not much work has been done since that. So, 
it was kind of before the idea of genetics and before the idea of uh, family trees and systematics and phylogeny really really kicked off so he he grouped them into into what he thought were most similar groups of the sticklers so he came out with about nine groups of sticklers and said these ones are the grassland species these ones are the forest species these ones are the wetland species and they're all closely related together and for a few of them he couldn't place and he did say I think this one might be closer to that one because of its wing shape or because of its leg shape or because of its size or because of its cause. So he was really really quite into this holistic approach but he only had limited tools at his disposal. It was in the 1930s, it was before, uh, before computers, before a lot of the fancy uh, analytical software that we have, some of the ghost statistics that we use. Uh, especially for systematics and taxonomy um, to make a phylogeny you have to use a whole lot of uh, well you don't have to but it's useful to use quite sophisticated models and programs and computers that can compare different aspects of the animals biology and spit out an answer as to how it uh, is related to the other individuals and none of this was at his disposal. He just used his intimate knowledge of the group, his experience with looking at them in the field, and he grouped them into these nine different groups of cysticlers. And it cleared up a lot of confusion. It was a huge body of work, and it was really, really quite appreciated. But as I said, it's basically been untouched since then. No major work has been done on the group since lines. A couple of things have happened here and there, some new species have been described, but there hasn't been a big review of the genus since. Here we have a rather disheveled looking black winged kite. Everyone calls them the black shouldered kite. I don't, however. I prefer to call them the black winged kite because there is a black shouldered kite in Australia. Uh, so we might as well call ours something a little bit different. I was saying I shan't let these lesser birds distract us from the main conversation of fantastic cysticulars. So, because Lyons took such meticulous notes about nearly every aspect of the biology of the of cysticlids, we thought now that we've got some rather sophisticated tools, uh, statistical analyses and computer programs, what if we input the data that he collected about these birds, all the behavior, all of the measurements, uh, the color, the plumage, all of these things, what if we captured all the data that he wrote down in his monograph and whacked it through some of our sophisticated statistical analyses. What result will we get? As I said, he didn't have access to this kind of technology when he was writing his monograph. So, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to see what result we get. And, it turns out he was pretty pretty accurate so after capturing all the data that he uh, that he had in his monograph we busted through some statistics and what came out the other side but the groupings that he suggested without the luxury of having uh, sophisticated computer programs so, I mean, that's impressive anyway, to get those results in the 1930s. So we were feeling, we were feeling like, yeah, this is, this is pretty good, but what if the job's done? What if he did the job so well, then there's, there's, there's no real point in us doing it. So you look closer at the data and you realize that the way these groups have been pulled out is based on similarity. So he was grouping his cysticlers together 
um, in terms of how similar they were to one another, which is a perfectly acceptable uh, idea, especially in the 1930s, to group things that are similar in some way or another. They have the same cores, they have the same feet, they have the same uh, shape of their, their, their first primary feather, these kind of things. So he grouped them together the best way he thought they were. But because they're so similar, this can be a little bit misleading. So by grouping very similar things by similarity, you might get an instance where there's convergent evolution, where things look the same because they do the same thing, they live in the same habitat, they might group together rather than grouping together because they are closely related to each other. So, if two things are doing the same kind of thing, they might look the same and you might group them together, but this might be misleading. A good example is your swifts and swallows. Swift swallows martens all look very, very similar. Long streamlined wings, small bodies, small feet. Great for catching insects on the wing. Great for traveling long distances. However, swifts and swallows are not closely related to each other. This is a, a convergent evolution which has made them look the same because they are doing the same thing rather than because they are closely related. So, by grouping cysticulars by similarity, how closely they look to each other, how similar they are to each other, the way lions did in the 1930s, was potentially misleading. And the only way that we were going to get to the bottom of this is by doing genetics on them, by getting their DNA and seeing how closely related they actually are. But they occur throughout Africa. There's over 50 species. How are we going to get DNA from birds throughout Africa? It seems like a pretty big task. But we might not have to travel through Africa and collect samples of cysticulars throughout Africa because if you recall I told you earlier someone already did that for us so Lines on his expedition went through Africa and collected some specimens from all over Africa and kept them in a museum and he had probably had no idea that they would become so useful uh, near 80 years later and this is one of the many good arguments for why museum specimens and collecting actual specimens is so valuable for science because now all of his specimens were housed in the Natural History Museum in Tring well a lot of them were and if we could figure out how to get DNA from those old specimens without destroying them, we firstly wouldn't have to uh, collect any more specimens and secondly we wouldn't have to waste time and money traveling to all these areas uh, trying to collect them ourselves and we could compare results, genetic results, with the very same specimens that he used to construct his, uh, his groupings which is invaluable and we did and if you run the genetic analyses on the cysticulars what happens does it look the same as when you group them by similarity or are there a couple of surprises and what does it tell you if anything about the evolution of cysticulars and the evolution of the habitats across Africa? Mm, good questions, all very good questions. Are you waiting for the answer? Well, you shall have to wait a little bit longer.
nice thing about this wet weather is that some of the small frogs and amphibians come out. I was hoping to see one of these. This is tiny. Looks like a tiny little pygmy toad. You can hear some Aramark babblers in the background and I can hear a little and button quail and a ubiquitous cysticula, a rufous naped lark. Cape turtle dove. Look at this fantastic camouflage. I tell you what, I can actually hear different types of cysticula, which is very, very exciting. We're going to go and see if we can find it to continue the cysticula saga. We'll see. It's completely different to the one we were looking at earlier. That's a desert. It's a stick of that. A desert a stick of that, you say? We're not in the desert. No. We're not in the desert. However, this park is really quite interesting. It doesn't look like a desert now, but it's in between two bioregions that are quite um, famous for their games. So the Kalahari Desert, uh, further to the northwest, and the Lofelt, which you know all about from the, the Sabi Sands, etc is to the east. So this is kind of a intermediate zone uh, in between the two types of habitat. So you can get quite a strange mix of species here, which is really quite nice and it makes this park quite unique, is that you can get species that occur in the desert, like the desert's a stickler, and there's, I'm sure there'll be a couple of springbok running around as well, which are arid adapted species. Uh, alongside the impalas that you saw earlier, which are more low felt kind of species. So this particular area is really quite interesting to have this mix between the arid Kalahari species and the low felt species. So you get brown hyena here, which will be cool. I'm sure some of you have seen them on the on the uh, uh, one of the dam cams. That, that actually, we'll go and have a look and see if we can wave at the dam cam. But, yeah, although this isn't, uh, it doesn't look like a desert, you get quite a few deserty species here. And it's not just because they were brought in um, by the people stocking this reserve. It is a natural uh, intermediate area between, between the Low Felt and the Kalahari Desert, which makes us, it's pretty interesting. It's also really, really nice for visitors because, I mean, it is quite small, but... You don't have to worry about malaria here at all, so um, it's a malaria-free area, which is quite nice. Let me see if uh, we can find that desert cysticla again. And you might be wondering how I could tell it was a desert cysticla if they all look so similar. Am I some kind of genius? Well, I am. But... An easy way to tell the cysticlas apart is their calls. So this is quite clearly a desert cysticla. And not desiting. It. 
You can tell by the way it's on. There we go. They also have a high aerial display, but you can hear it's more of a clunky click than a zitting zit. Expect a lion to be on the top. However, there is a clip springer perched on the top. Classic clip springer type environment. Clip springer, obviously, well, for those that don't know, roughly translates to rock jumper and uh, it's on a rock so they've got soft uh, softish hooves which helps them grip on this grip on the rocks and they've got extra extra boiny extra springy fur pelage got an undercoat which seems extra springy Seems to help them bounce if they fall off the rocks. Uh, I'm gonna try and. I think it's Aurea Tragus. Mm. The chances are that I've messed that up. But it's uh, cool to see him perched up there. Usually travel in in pairs surveying his surveying his land perfect size prey for a leopard still see him poking his head over the top Or maybe it's a her. I don't really tell. The males have horns. I didn't see if you you could see if he had horns or not. See all of this white. This is all from the rock hyrax from the Dassies. This is the uric urea. The urine stains the rocks. And sometimes they relieve themselves in the same place all the time. And some of these toilets, they're like 10,000 years old. I wonder if maybe we won't see one. Because there's also a lot of interesting stuff to say about Hyrax or Dussies. As they are Afrotherians. <coughs> oh goodness. And related to the elephants, as you well know. The structure of their teeth. They've got, uh, they've got little tusks. So the structure of their teeth and the structure of their feet. The placement of their genitals, all give away their relationship with elephants. They've got a little bit of a prehensile nose, I guess. But ultimately, again, their genetics is what seals the deal. It lets us know they are closely related to elephants, which are related to the manatees and the dugongs. They also have pectoral mammae or boobs between their arms like we do except we're not related that closely to elephants we are of course primates so the elephants basically don't have any plural space between their lungs and their chest cavity so their, li their lungs are basically connected to their ribcage and 
their testicles are internal. They don't have elephants walking around with these giant uh, space hoppers, I guess, bouncing around. Kind of makes you makes you wonder if their uh, ancestor was also aquatic, like the manatees are. You can see a little elephant. One of them is very unhappy, shouting and squealing. So these one of two species that we get in Africa the other one so this is the African bush elephant African savannah elephant Loxodonta africana the other one we get Loxodonta cyclotus the African forest elephant you see in the Central Africa forests now, oh, if you go to the Wikipedia page, actually, and I can't do it now, I can't show you, there's no reception. Let me have a look. Oh, there's no reception here. You'll see the forest elephant. It'll say that the forest elephant has a different number of toenails to the savannah elephant. But that is actually not true at all. They have the same number of toenails. Well, the individual variation within each species is so high that you'll find some with a different number of toenails in both populations, in both species. So it's not a good diagnostic character, that's what we would say, to differentiate between the African savanna or African bush elephant and the forest elephant. I'm gonna go see what the the small one is shouting in. But interestingly, you'll hear I, I talk a lot about how things are related because I find it fascinating evolution and and phylogenies and um, how things are related to family trees. So if you also Google Paleoloxodonta antiquus antiquus like antique Paleoloxodonta was a huge elephant giant it's called the giant straight tusked elephant it was found in Europe and it is more closely related thanks to genetics we've found out it's more closely related to the African forest elephant than the African forest elephant is related to these elephants so if you look at the videos that um, Tristan Dix has filmed of the forest elephant I've never seen one but you'll notice they also have very straight tusks so them being related to the giant straight tusked elephant of Europe is, is not that surprising if they both have fairly straight tusks but the size of that European that old European elephant was it was enormous and then obviously you get the Asian elephant which is Elephas it's not Loxodonta different genus and Elephas is actually more closely related to the mammoths Mamutus mm, Primogenius, perhaps? Alright, let's see if we can get a...
we can see um, her toenails. I was thought that I think maybe those previous vehicles were annoying them a little bit. People don't really turn off their cars to watch the elephants. The cars is what makes them oh, it's a giant warthog. It's just run out of the road. So it was thought that maybe the forest elephants had a larger number of toenails to help them kick branches and protect their feet from all the branches that you'd find in a forest compared to what you'd find in the savanna. But if you watch them closely, they use their feet for a lot. They're always kicking. I'm just listening to their the vocalization, see what they're telling me. They're super relaxed. So I don't know what those other cars did. See if we can sneak a little bit around the corner and see if we can spend a bit more time with him. The herd goes all the way up, all the way up the mountain. That lovely smell of it's almost like horse stables when they get wet like this I see a few small ones up the up the hill let's see if we can get a good angle Coming back along this road, anyway, so let's just see one really close. I think we'll leave them be until we head on back. I really <laughs> don't have much time to spend with these things, and I want to get to want to get to that webcam just for fun. Uh, it shouldn't be that far, and then hopefully we can spend a bit more time with them on the way back. 
do we have here? A butterfly. Oh, just joking. There is a Wut Renoster. White Rhino. Ceratotherium Simum. Can tell by the tube like ears. The rather flat back, no big hump. And the giant horn. <laughs> Just checking. So, this is a white rhino. The ones you see in the Mara are the black rhino. You can see he's not white, he's a little bit brown. And, um, so, you often hear the story that the white rhino was given his name because of what I just said, the Wit Renoster means white in Afrikaans, but um, there's also a story that says that the white rhino got his name from the a Dutch word for weight. The weight or weight which means wide, wide-lipped rhino, square-lipped rhino. But I'm again not a big fan of this. It sounds good, but there doesn't seem to be much evidence for it. So nowhere are they referred to as Veit Renoster in Dutch. Um, so it seems like it seems like a plausible story, which is I think why we all get taught it as this thing that you should know if you know about animals, but there doesn't seem to be much record or much evidence that that was the case, that it was ever referred to as a weight or wide rhino before it was referred to as a white rhino in, in terms of the color. Why exactly it's called the white rhino, we're not sure, but I'm pretty sure that the mistranslation story from the Dutch Veit is not the be all and end all of the story. A lot of languages do call them wide lipped rhino, and the black rhino, the hook lipped rhino, or the point rhino, point lipped rhino. But for the time being, there's not enough evidence for me uh, to suggest that it was just a miss, uh, or it came from the Dutch for weight. One of the other theories, again, if we're going back to the history of Africa and I think Ian Player uh, he wrote a book in 1972 about white rhino suggested that it was called the white rhino because it was timid like the white man and not aggressive like the black rhino and not full of wild energy like the black man so in terms of its um, temperament he suggested that uh, that it has been suggested that uh, it was called the white rhino because it had a docile temperament like the like the white man but um, I guess these kind of racial stereotypes are also not my favorite You can see kind of um, those stripes or folds of skin where where you'd imagine its ribs are. One of the good ways to tell the black rhino 
in uh, southern Africa from the black rhino that you see up in Kenya in the Masai Mara is the ones in Kenya have very pronounced folds there around the ribs. They look like ribs. But they are not. They're just uh, folds of skin. But the ones in southern Africa don't have it. This guy obviously is not a black rhino so it doesn't really count but I just thought uh, it just reminded me of those black rhino in Kenya. You can see they've got very distinctive rib folds of their skin. Well, it's nice to see these chaps walking around and they're not being killed. It's always a plus. When you see one alive, it's not going to be much longer before they're all gone. Happy days. So, we shall move on. I'm on my way to Quab Maritani. I'm sure those of you that watch the dam cams have heard of that. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see this chap on the way back, actually. He does seem to be coming this way. Let me do a U-turn. The evolution is quite interesting. There was a long ago they used to be more horse-like they didn't have the horn they used to be long-legged and quite fleet-footed and uh, yeah quite horse-like then you got something called uh, Paraceratherium which was basically one of the largest land and well the largest land animal land mammal uh, to have roamed the earth. It's also an ancestor, also a hornless type of rhino. But then, yeah, they were about seven meters tall. Which is not bad. Paraceratherium. It's really, really, Google it. It's huge. Think an elephant's big. This thing put elephants to shame. But it was part of the one of the, di um, the ancestors of the the rhinoceros. And then uh, you get the Sumatran rhino, which is probably basal to the extant living rhinoceros, which means it's the oldest offshoot of the branch. And then you get the Javan and the Indian rhinoceros coming off, and then the the black and white rhino uh, come off thereafter. So Ceratotherium simum is this white rhino and the black rhino is Dicerus bicornus. Uh, so they're in different genera but they can uh, hybridize actually. One of the earliest records of the white rhino, if you read, uh, if you google Tetrapod Zoology, you listen to the Tetsu podcast, or if you read the Tetsu blogs from Darren Nash, Dr. Nash, he's got a good write-up of the of the naming of the white rhino. Just look up Darren Nash white rhino name. He's got a, a yeah, pretty good historical accounts of whenever it has been referred to historically and. Uh, no one's been able to find much evidence that it was this fate, fate limb. I think the first ones I saw were around Kuruman in Northern Cape. Oh, the, the black rhino and Natasha often cover themselves in white mud, but uh, I think the first two 
Records. The first record of the White Rhino was indeed. Um, I think they they got they were they were hunted. I think they were actually Black Rhino. Sorry, I'm just uh, my concentration is lacking because I've got a bit of a river crossing. So I'm a bit distracted. Hopefully the road is still here. You should always get out and walk the crossing. However, we're not allowed to get out. So, just a uh, oh, rental vehicle to the rescue. We're going to Kwa Maritane now. One of the Wild Earth webcams is there. Some of you might be familiar with it. I thought I would go and see if I can find the webcam and maybe wave. But actually I can't get in front of it, I know that already. A really big bull in the road. Magnificent. Let's go see if we can approach him with caution. These are cheeky. Cheek animals, they've been taught very poor manners by poorly behaved tourists. So let's see what we can do. I'm sure you must have heard of the, the elephant problem. Because big bull elephants were so hard to relocate, some of the populations that were brought to the Pilansberg were a little bit skewed. So big bull elephants, pretty hard to transport. The populations of elephants that were brought to the Pilansberg were mostly females and young males. And these young males had no one to give them a hiding and teach them a lesson. So it's quite a famous story that they were, when they become adolescents and they went into, into must, they had no big bull elephants to teach them how to do it or to put them in their place or to suppress their, their bad behavior. So they were actually causing a real, real problem here. They were targeting and killing and trying to mate with the rhinoceros population, which uh, obviously was not ideal. So eventually, to try and curb this issue, they brought in some big bulls from the Kruger National Park, and that seemed to have sorted out the young, the young bulls. So they don't have much more They don't have much more problems with the, with the young bull elephants with this misplaced aggression and directing it towards rhinoceros and whatever they could bully and kill. So the big boys have, have come and put the, the youngsters in their place. I was looking at all these marulas on the ground. I thought, mmm, they're not ripe yet. But what is this interesting African fruit? I've never seen one before. Uh, old soccer ball. That uh, it tricked me a little bit. I was a bit worried that my botany was lacking. I really couldn't figure out quickly enough what type of ground gourd that was.
they've been spotted. Beautiful pair of male lions. They don't seem like they're actively hunting, they're just going for a stroll. A magnificent beast. This one, everybody, is another rattling cysticula. There's a car behind me. He thinks I've spotted something interesting. like those ambulance chasers. People that look for a good story, they're chasing ambulances around looking for some action. So I've stopped here actually for a cysticula, a small LBJ, a little brown bird that no one really would be interested in. But I want to show you because I, I love them. But these guys behind me think I've seen a, a line or something because I've been sitting here for 20 minutes. I've been waiting for them to fuck off. I mean waiting for them to leave but they obviously think that I've got something good but I just want to film this tiny little brown bird uh, so I'm having a I'm annoyed and uh, amused at the same time let's put it that way and they're still trying to figure it out Five toenails on the forefoot, four on the hind foot, like Asian elephants, unlike African bush elephant. Now, basically that's crap.